So thank you all for joining us. Uh, good evening. I'm Trevor Morrison. I'm the Dean here at NYU School of Law, and we are thrilled that you could all be with us th this evening uh, for the 78th dedication of the annual survey of American law. Um, about a year ago, when we had the dedication of the 77th uh, volume of the annual survey, that was, I think, just about the last in-person event that we had here at NYU before moving to our um, a predominantly remote state that we've been in for the last year. We wish we could be gathering in person this year, but of course, um, circumstances preclude that, but we are very glad that you could all join us this evening for what will be, I'm sure, a really terrific event. Um, each year, the annual survey dedicates its forthcoming issue uh, to a person who has made a significant contribution to the legal field. And over the years, we've had the privilege of dedicating many issues to members of the Supreme Court, uh, to judges on the United States Courts of Appeals, uh, and to legal academics uh, who have been hugely influential in their career. Uh, and this year, uh, we are tremendously honored to add to that roster uh, Justice Elena Kagan of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Kagan, it really is an honor for all of us um, that you could join us for this evening um, and accept this dedication. Thank you very much for that. Um, I want to now welcome Ilan Weinberger, who's the editor-in-chief of the annual survey, who will say a few words. Ilan. Thank you, Dean Morrison. Good evening. Before I started law school, my father, who himself is an attorney, would consistently relay an old adage about law school. The first year, they scare you to death. The second year, they work you to death. And the third year, they bore you to death. As I now reflect on my three years in law school, despite the tumult and craziness that has saturated our lives over the past year, I certainly agree that my father's words ring true. Even though, frankly, I'm certainly not bored during my last year of law school, but despite the accuracy and humor of this statement, it also offers insight into the way our profession is structured. Lawyers live in the extreme. We are zealous advocates for our clients. Judicial opinions, law review articles, briefs, and other legal writing consistently and continually invoke the idea of the slippery slope, testing arguments by stretching them to their most logical extreme. Our journal and thousands of other journals like it frequently publish articles based on perfected hypotheticals, which push the bounds of legal thinking. It is therefore fitting that lawyers in the law played such a prominent role during this past year. As COVID-19 ravaged our world and forced our country into lockdown, facing one of the most extreme public health crises humanity has ever seen, our constitutional system faced some of its most difficult tests. From questions concerning voter fraud and voter rights, to the treatment of religious institutions, the legal profession has played a game of tug of war as it attempts to pull America, American jurisprudence towards one extreme or another. This type of extremism has not only played out in the legal field, but also in politics, as both political parties march further and further away from each other towards an ideological extremism that may soon prove untenable in American democracy. In the face of these extremes, in both the legal and political fields, we must remember the importance of balance and consensus. Indeed, the genius of our constitutional system lay in the balance of powers, whereby three co-equal branches of government, none more powerful than the next, are charged with leading our nation through the de democratic experiment. Yet this experiment did not always provide equal power to the equal branches. While in the early days of the Republic, centers of power and historical experience endowed the political branches with immense powers. However, without either the power of the purse or power of the sword, the judiciary was required to forge its own strength. And it did so by reaching consensus. One of the court's champions of balance and consensus was Chief Justice Marshall who upon taking the bench institutionalized the practice of writing a single majority opinion, claiming that if any part of the opinion's reasoning be disproved, it must be so modified as to receive the approbation of all before it can be delivered as the opinion of all. 
Marshall also woven the idea of consensus into the holdings in his cases. In Marbury v. Madison, the court struck, struck the balance of agreeing with Marbury on the merits while dispensing with the case for lack of jurisdiction. In striking this balance, Chief Justice Marshall created one of the most important aspects of the judiciary, judicial review. The legacy of Chief Justice Marshall is one of achieving unity and balance. However, throughout American history, protectors of consensus have continued to protect our democracy and pull us back from the brink of extremism and polarization. Tonight, we have the privilege to honor one of the most foremost protectors of consensus and balance of our time, Justice Elena Kagan. Justice Kagan is well known for her diplomatic abilities on the court, striving to reach consensus with her conservative colleagues. During her nomination, President Obama described Justice Kagan as a consensus builder, citing her time as Dean of Harvard Law School, where she mended divisions amongst faculty members and broke fundraising records. Justice Kagan began developing this diplomatic style from a young age, as she has credited her father for influencing her desire to reach agreement as frequently as possible. And while on the court, Justice Kagan rarely writes concurring opinions, all in the hopes of reaching consensus with her colleagues in the majority or in the dissent. Justice Kagan, we dedicate our volumes to those individuals that have made incredible contributions to the practice of American law. Your tenure in private practice, academia, the government, and now on the bench certainly qualify you for this honor in any year. However, your dedication to finding agreement and balance amongst a sea of division and extremism make you a particularly appropriate dedicatee for our upcoming volume. On behalf of the annual survey of American law, we are honored that you are able to join us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ilan. Uh, very well said. So I'm going to introduce each of our speakers in turn. As I've told them, I'm not going to give any of them the introduction that they deserve because that would cause tonight's event to stretch on for many hours. I'll just name them and turn things over to each of them in turn. We will begin uh, with Chief Judge Sri Srinivasan of the United States Court of Appeals of the District Colum for the District of Columbia Circuit. Sri? Thank you, Trevor. Uh and thank you, Alon, and what a wonderful occasion this is. Thanks to NYU and to the students who put together the annual survey of American law for inviting me to participate in the celebration of, of, uh, of my friend, Justice Elena Kagan. Uh, to say that she's a fitting recipient of an award meant to honor contributions to the law is to say the most severe understatement. So I'm not even gonna begin in that way. I'm gonna begin in another way that I think does capture uh, her status in the profession. I've been fortunate to have had an amazing group of law clerks in my time on the bench, some of whom have been very lucky to then go on to clerk for Justice Kagan. You're going to hear from one, Yaira Dubin, shortly. One of those lucky clerks, not Yair, by the way, put things in somewhat uncomfortably revealing comparative perspective to me after having just completed the clerkship with Justice Kagan. Here's how this person described their experience with her. And yes, I'm par paraphrasing a bit, and bear in mind, just to reemphasize that this is someone who had just clerked for me as well. Judge, this clerk conveyed excitedly, it's such an enlightening and unique experience to get to work with someone who is just so brilliant. Yes, I thought to myself, that must have been quite a revelation to finally get to do that. Judge, she cares so deeply about all the words in her opinions, and she has the most uncanny ability to identify just the right way to put a point. Mm-hmm. Sure, I'm thinking to myself, I'm so glad you at long last got to witness that kind of ability. Must have been really edifying. And so on, you get the gist. Well, all of this is decidedly true. Justice Kagan is in many ways the judicial equivalent of what Major League Baseball scouts call a five-tool player. The rare person who excels at every aspect of the game that marks a player's talent. She does it all and does it exceedingly well. We could talk at length, for example, about our insightful and skillful questioning at oral argument, of which I've been both a victim and a beneficiary when appearing before the court. I wanna focus though on a different attribute, one that relates to the way in which Justice Kagan's contributions to the law 
may be felt most directly and tangibly, and that's her opinions. It's a truism to observe that she's a notably gifted and effective writer, but what is it about her opinions that rightly sparks the admiration of so many and that's so distinctive? For this, I'd like to strip away some essential ingredients of compelling writing that we see in abundance in Justice Kagan's opinions. It's a given, for instance, that clear and, and insightful thinking begets clear and insightful writing. The ability to distill the most complex of legal issues to their essence, and ideally to capture that essence with a simple example or hypothetical, is a hallmark of the best lawyering. And arriving at that level of insight and then communicating it in an opinion naturally makes for highly effective writing. Justice Kagan does all of that breathtakingly well, but I'm just gonna take that as a given for now. The same goes for the organization of the points in an opinion. Once one arrives at the key insights, there's the question of how precisely to sequence the points and build the arguments. That attention to effective sequencing is also omnipresent in Justice Kagan's opinions, but I'm just gonna take that as a given as well. Even if we assume the acuteness of the insights and the skillful ordering of com communicating them that characterize a Kagan opinion, there's still something more that's markedly distinctive about her presentation. It lies in the particular way the points are conveyed, the specific word choices, and the interposition of just the right overarching themes in just the right way. I'd capture it like this. When I sit down with a Kagan opinion, I don't just read words that have been written for me. I hear words that are being spoken to me. And I don't mean this in the sense of an audio book, as something, something that was originally meant to be read, but is now being heard aloud because you didn't have the time to read it. That's not what I mean. I mean it more in the sense of something that was meant all along to be said aloud to an audience, but is now being transcribed in case you weren't on hand for the original oration. Some of this comes from the accessibility and relative informality of the language. The prose is easy on the eyes and ears. You don't need to be a lawyer well-versed in the case, or maybe even a lawyer at all, to follow along. And it's not just the word choices that, that evoke someone actually speaking with you, so boatloads instead of plethora, for example or the manageable length of the sentences. It's also the posing of questions as transitional devices and the relative lack of footnotes and lengthy complicated citations. You don't ordinarily hear speakers recite lengthy complicated citations when they're delivering a speech. There's also this, when reading a Kagan opinion, you never need to double back to reread a point, nor are you tempted to skip forward. Just the same when you hear some, someone speaking live, you don't get to hit rewind to replay something they've said already nor do you get to press a fast forward button. Now, some of you may be regretting the inability to hit a fast forward button right now, but I'm gonna press on. Instead, you listen to someone speak in real time. And if their speech is well done, you stay right with it throughout. So it is with reading a Kagan opinion. You're always comfortable right where you are on the opinion. You know just what you need to know to appreciate the point being made and what you're told sparks interest in what's to come. The impression I'm left with when reading her opinions, whether intended or not, is that this is someone who's not just writing something for you to read, she's saying something for you to hear. She writes it how one would best say it, and that's then how you digest it. And that makes for an unusually engaging reading, or more to the point, listening experience. I'll close with two examples. The first is from her dissenting opinion in Rucho, the partisan gerrymandering case. And let me just make a prefatory point about this, these examples at the outset, which I hope it goes without saying. I'm of course not meaning to comment on the ultimate correctness of either the majority or dissenting opinion. I mean to focus on Justice Kagan's writing. And in one paragraph of her dissent in that case, she engages with the majority submission that it would be difficult for a court to define how much divergence from proportional partisan representation might suffice to make out a constitutional violation. She communicates a response this way. She asks, quote, how much is too much and then offers this as a quote, first cut answer. This much is too much, followed by a sentence on what was actually shown in the cases before the court. And then on three occasions in that paragraph, she asks, how much is too much? And then answers, this much is too much. One can easily imagine a speech in which the speaker asks the audience, how much is too much? And the audience, upon becoming aware of the prompt and the elicited response, chimes in in unison, this much is too much. Reading this paragraph in Rucho is to hear it said aloud. The last example comes from Justice Kagan's dissenting opinion in the Town of Greece case concerning the constitutionality of prayers delivered at the commencement of monthly town board meetings. 
she began her opinion as follows. For centuries now, people have come to this country from every corner of the world to share in the blessing of religious freedom. Our constitution promises that they may worship in their own way without fear of penalty or danger. And that in itself is a momentous offering. Yet our constitution makes a commitment still more remarkable that however those individuals worship, they will count as full and equal American citizens, a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, and so forth. Each stands in the same relationship with their country, with their state and local communities, and with every level and body of government. So that when each person performs the duties or seeks the benefits of citizenship, she does so not as an adherent to one or another religion, but simply as an American. That's by any estimation, a beautiful meditation. And it vividly illustrates the oratorical quality of her writing. The decision in town of Greece was handed down within months of my joining the DC circuit. I'd come into judicial office upon swearing an oath of allegiance to the constitution with my hand resting on my father's Bhagavad Gita after having become a naturalized American citizen only in adulthood. When I read Justice Kagan's words about the remarkable commitment made by our constitution, that when, when one performs the duties or seeks the benefits of citizenship, she does so not as an adherent to one or another religion, but simply as an American. I didn't merely read those words on a page. I actually heard them being spoken in my ear as a validational testimonial about my station in public service to my country as someone with my background. That is the brand of engagement with the audience that can come from a Justice Kagan opinion and we are all the better for the experience. One aspect of effectively engaging with an audience is knowing when to stop, which I'll do now. I'm so pleased to participate in this event, honoring my friend, Elena Kagan, the kind of friend who gets in touch at just the right moments, and not just when, say hypothetically, one's favorite team might have just suffered a bitterly disappointing loss in the NCAA tournament. I'm grateful for her friendship and also for her example. I'm grateful to the students for dedicating the forthcoming volume to her and inv inviting me to join in this celebration this evening. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Shri. If we were in person, we would all be applauding, uh, but thank you very much. Next, uh, we'll hear from John Manning, the Morgan and Helen Chu Dean and Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, the holder of an office that Justice Kagan held uh, two deans before, uh, and also my former federal courts teacher. John, it's a pleasure to introduce you in this context. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Morrison, and thank you, Elan, and, and to the students and staff at NYU uh, for all the work you've done to bring this uh, night together. Uh, delighted to be here to honor uh, my friend, uh, Justice Kagan. Um, so when someone asks you to reflect on a person like Justice Kagan, who has lived many lives, uh, legal scholar, law dean, Solicitor General, Supreme Court Justice. The challenge is to narrow the frame to something that's both manageable and meaningful. So I th thought I'd take the occasion to talk about just one aspect of Justice Kagan's work in an area that I follow closely, uh, the constitutional structure. So in that area, I think of Justice Kagan as the latest in a line of great institution-minded justices. Folks like Brandeis, Stone, Jackson, and Scalia who very much kept front of mind in their opinions, the capacities and proper role of the courts. They came to very different conclusions about what that meant, but all shared the trait of being unusually mindful of the standard of review that should guide them in their decisions. To put it in administrative law terms, um, each of them had a very pronounced step zero in their analysis. So I think Justice Jackson is perhaps the closest analog um, Recall his famous account of why he took a restrained view of federal habeas corpus. Quote, reversal by a higher court is not proof that justice is thereby better done. We are not final because we are infallible, but we are infallible only because we are final. Or consider his confession in Youngstown that when it comes to separation of powers, quote, a judge may be surprised at the poverty of really useful and unambiguous authority. Just what our forefathers did envision or would have envisioned had they foreseen modern conditions must be divine from materials almost in, as enigmatic as the dreams Joseph was called upon to interpret for Pharaoh. 
that same self-awareness, that same sense of institutional humility is admirably front and center in Justice Kagan's work. And I'll give three examples, two statutory and one constitutional. So in statutory cases, Justice Kagan's sense of uh, in the institution leads her to an admirable instinct for judicial self-denial, something that does not always come easily to judges. She knows that sometimes her job is to enforce policies that are clearly wrong-headed, but also clearly expressed in the statute she's reading. So take her famous opinion in Milner versus Department of the Navy. There, Justice Kagan quite rightly held that a FOIA exemption for personnel records did not shield Navy ordinance maps, documents that tell us how far apart to store bombs in order to prevent a chain reaction. Uh, certainly, Justice Kagan understandably did not like the outcome she thought required by, quote, the 12 simple words of exemption two. But she explained, again, quote, the judicial role is to enforce the congressionally determined balance rather than to assess case by case, department by department, and task by task, whether disclosure interferes with good government. Another famous example is Yates versus United States, in which Justice Kagan concluded that red grouper, yes, the fish, uh, are in fact, quote, tangible objects under a statute making it a crime to tamper with, quote, any record, document, or tangible object in order to interfere with, the, interfere with a federal investigation. In this case, as you can imagine, one by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, as straightforward as her position was, Justice Kagan rightly worried that her reading would give the statute a scope that was, in her words, quote, too broad and undifferentiated with too high maximum penalties, which give prosecutors too much leverage and sentencers too much discretion. Still, she wrote, and I quote, whatever the wisdom or folly of the statute, this court does not get to rewrite the law. If judges disagree with Congress's choice, we are perfectly entitled to say so in lectures, in law review articles, and even in dicta. But we are not entitled to replace the statute Congress enacted with an alternative of our own design. My third example, concerns what I think may be Justice Kagan's most important opinion to date, her dissent last term in SELA law. In that case, a 5-4 court held that a restriction on the president's removal power does not violate Article II when applied to a multi-member regulatory agency, but does violate Article II when applied to a single-headed agency like the CFPB. Now, the question of removal, I think, is generally a difficult one. Certainly under Article II, the president has all the executive power and a duty to ensure that the laws be faithfully executed. But the distinction drawn by the court in seal of law rests on a freestanding, functionalist separation of powers analysis, according to which removal restrictions that apply to the heads of multi-member agencies are okay because, to simplify just a bit, there are simply more checks on unaccountable regulatory authority when the agency's power is divided among several commissioners. Now, aside from taking on the majority's analysis on its own terms, Justice Kagan's dissent in, our, in SELA law articulates powerfully what I regard as a, an appropriate standard of review in separation of powers cases. No text, history, or tradition compelled the majority's result. In Justice Kagan's words, the abstract, quote, abstract separation of powers arguments on which the majority relied were, quote, more than the emanations of the text will bear. So what should the court have done? In this case, Justice Kagan said, because the removal restriction did not trench upon explicit presidential powers, um, the court's job was to defer to, not second guess Congress's judgment. And why was that? Again, it's all about the proper institutional allocation of power, the role of the federal courts. Invoking Chief Justice Marshall's famous opinion in McCulloch versus Maryland, here's what she wrote. The constitution says only a few words about administration. It authorizes Congress 
to meet new exigencies with new devices. So Article 2 does not generally prohibit independent agencies, nor do any supposed structural principles, nor do any odors wafting from the document, save for when those agencies impede the president's performance of his own constitutional duties, the matter is left up to Congress. In other words, because the Constitution does not quote, the Constitution does not distinguish between a single director and multi-member independent agencies, and because quote, it instructs Congress, not this court, to decide on agency design. For Justice Kagan, the court's job was to accept Congress's judgment, agree with it or not. Okay, just a few quick thoughts in closing on why Justice Kagan's institutional approach is so powerful. First, I think it reflects a sound reading of the Constitution. Uh, in seal of law, as I mentioned, Justice Kagan invokes McCulloch versus Maryland. She invokes the necessary and, pro and proper clause. That clause gives Congress, not the judiciary, primary responsibility for composing the government. So under a Chevron-like theory of the Constitution, maybe the court should defer to Congress on structural questions unless Congress, the Constitution speaks directly to the precise question at issue. Call it Thayerism, call it McCulloch deference, call it St Kagan step one. As I've said before, I think it's how best to understand the document. Second and relatedly, given the deep complexity of law and the absence of unambiguously right answers, at least in the cases that get to the court, a judge who starts with a felt sense that her job is to accept the decisions of another branch of government unless clearly wrong is more likely to avoid false positives over time. Third and finally, it is becoming of public for public officials to be mindful of their power and its limits. That impulse to me feels like it channels the very best of the legal process tradition. We as a society come together, we devise a set of institutions and processes to help us resolve our disputes peacefully. And we agree in advance to abide by the outcomes of those processes, even if we don't like all of them. That to me is the essence of the rule of law. And that is why the deep integrity of Justice Kagan's institutional approach is critically important always, and especially in a time when the world is so polarized and divided. So there you are. Justice Kagan, after a decade of service on the Supreme Court, you have had a strong and distinctive impact on American law. Though some of your greatest opinions are now dissents, they may sow the seeds of future majorities as those of some of your great institution-minded predecessors did. May you enjoy many decades on the court. We are grateful for your service and for all you do to keep our constitutional democracy bound to its greatest ambitions, to be a government of laws and to advance equal justice under law. Thank you. Thank you, John, wonderful. Now I'm very happy to introduce Judge David Barron of the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, Justice Kagan's former colleague, both in the Justice Department and on the Harvard faculty. David. David, I think you may be mute still. Thanks, Trevor. If, if for any reason my audio seems unstable. Could you just raise your hand so I'll see it and then I can see if I can adjust. We'll do. Uh, okay, great. Well, I'm so pleased uh, to be here tonight for this uh, great occasion. I, I wish like all of you, we could be physically uh, present together for it, but unfortunately uh, we can't be. I wanna thank the students of the survey for all the work you've done and for the excellent selection uh, that you've uh, made. This is very much a deserved honor for Elena and I hope you'll forgive me for calling her by her first name uh, throughout. This honor reflects Elena's amazing contributions to America law in the first decade of her time as a justice, but also I think her contributions to American law for now more than a quarter of a century in academia, in the executive branch, and on the bench. I've had something of a ringside seat for almost every bit of it. 
In fact, I think there's only been a handful of years in my professional legal life when I haven't had the same employer as Elena, whether it was at Harvard Law School where we started together on the same day in adjoining offices in the Clinton administration, where I believe she was the first person outside the Justice Department I had to give legal advice to when she was a famously formidable associate counsel in the White House, in the Obama administration where we served together in the Justice Department, and now in the federal judiciary where, well, you know the roles that we have there. Over the course of that time, I've come to witness the admiration she has engendered at every stage, and also the deep devotion she has, a kind of faith you might even say, in every institution she has touched. It's an admiration born of her commitment to each of those institutions, to their traditions, their integrity, but also very much to an honest appraisal of their shortcomings and limitations, of their need to adapt and change, to grow and to improve, to become better than they were or are. There is no place, no place where Elena has been, where she has not been a leader in trying to make the institution live up to the promise of its potential, to earn the respect that it might be attempted just to claim. But more personally, I've also seen up close how Elena does her work. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'm the only person here tonight who's co-authored something with Elena. If I'm wrong, she will definitely correct me. <laughs> as I was preparing uh, these remarks, I mentioned to my wife, who's been a friend of Elena's for all these years as well, that fact. And she asked, well, what was that like writing something with Elena? And I said, well, you know Elena, so what do you think it was like? If you imagined it involved an intensely intellectually stimulating, but fun and enlivening, enlivening exchange of thinking in which seemingly technical legal issues became windows into broader ways of seeing and reflecting on politics and democracy, you most definitely would be right. If you imagined it involved constantly refining an idea and seeing the problems with it, you would be right too. But if you imagined it involved her passively and happily accepting my drafts of portions of the article and then complimenting them, passing on her own drafted portions for me to review, you would be, how should we say, wrong. It went more like this. I sent her an initial draft of what we had been working on. And then I remember a call placed by Elena in which it was decided that much the better way to proceed would be for her to take the pen and take it she did. I tell this story because it was the first time I had really seen something about Elena up close that has since become one of her most distinguishing features as a justice. She can write. And not just the way good writers can write, the way great writers can. With a voice all their own, a rhythm and a grace, an energy that keeps you moving through the page that makes the technical leap off of it, and then come alive, that grabs hold of you, make sure you're paying attention, but then keeps you paying attention because it's just so interesting to have someone so engaging instructing you. We all know that from Elena's opinions, the eloquence of them, the conviction that so evidently stands behind them, the generosity and the wit that they reflect. C. Well, Kagan goes one citation to her work in one of them, but also the occasional sense of disappointment that they acknowledge, the concern that they're willing to express that something has gone awry, maybe even deeply awry, but also the feeling of hope, intense hope, even faith that we'll do better next time, that she'll be sure to try. I wanna point out something though that works side by side with her style as a writer. It's not easy to be a great writer, so I don't mean to say it's effortless for her to write as she does, but it's especially hard, I think, writer, they have. Am I am I the only one not hearing David, or is he frozen for others as well? David, I don't know if that means you can hear us but your audio is can... If you turn off your video, you might do better with your audio. The challenge may be that he can't hear that excellent advice. Um, I was enjoying this so much too. <laughs> he's gone. Let's see, he's... He's gonna... Tune back in. Let's just give him a moment and see. David, if you can hear us, you're- I can hear you. Okay, great. And I think we can hear you. Are you there, There's David? a button that says leave and join. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. 
You can hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna try the video. Tell me if you can. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. If you no? want to, David. Yes, you, you can, okay. If, but if you want to try it, David, with only the audio, in case, um, in case that's- Yeah, I'm gonna do that. Okay, here we go. Okay, how's this, good? Yes. Good. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, well, that's sort of the rhythm, but here we go, back on track. So as I was saying, I want to point out with her for her to as she does. David, I think we're losing you again, I'm afraid. Um, your your audio is about fifteen percent. Um, One possibility would be to move to you hear me better now. You're, David, you're sort of in and out. Um, I definitely, um, we want to hear the ending. Um, yes. <laughs> um, if you're using wireless, David, uh, our IT people suggest just trying to be physically closer to wherever the router is in your home. Um, but if that won't work, or if that will take a while to work, why don't I suggest- How about Trevor, can you hear me now? I yeah. heard that just then, yeah. Do you want to- and want to How about it? now? Yeah. That's okay. Seems, that seems okay. Yes. Okay. Here we go. Sorry about this. Last. Okay. If this cuts out again, we'll have to send our remarks to Elena personally. Okay. But it's especially hard, I think, to be both a great writer and a great listener. That can be difficult because the great writer can't help but know that they have that gift. That has to make it so tempting to exploit that gift to overwhelm others with it. And I think that it would be easy to come upon the habit as somebody with that gift of hearing one's own voice, noticing it, and then admiring it so much that it would be hard to listen to the voice of others. That's not a problem for Elena and it never has been. For as great a writer as she is, she's just a great listener, a famously great one in fact. When I think back to all my times with Elena, I have so many images in my mind of her just listening, taking in the conversation, being fascinated by it, fixated on it, putting all the thoughts of others together in her mind, weighing all sides, asking a probing question, trying to account for what moves people. Not a strategist, or not just that, but a true listener, someone who, most of all, is seeking to understand. If there's ever been as good a writer who was also as good a listener as Elena on the bench, I don't know who it is. The result is that Elena wins converts to her cause even when you think she couldn't because for all the convictions she has about law and the deep belief that runs in her that there is an integrity in it about our democratic way of life and law's crucial role in preserving it, about equality and the role that law can and must play in bringing it about, she manages somehow not to have a cause that is just hers to which you must be converted. She may manages to persuade you, because I think it's also true that she is trying through sheer force of thought to understand what others are saying. The result is that she can mix those thoughts with what has occurred to her seamlessly, and then when the two have joined, the pen can take off with all the force hers has. Or as sometimes happens, the pen takes a rest, knowing that what others are saying on her behalf will do just fine. It was true of the revised draft that I got back from her in that article we wrote together now so many years ago, reflecting her voice to be sure, but our thoughts together as well. So I got a glimpse of all that in my early work with Elena, writing an article that had the distinction of being perhaps the only thing that either of us wrote that attracted absolutely no interest from any Senator as either of our confirmation hearings. Perhaps it was the title, Chevron's Non-Delegation Doctrine. No trigger words there, at least not then. But I do wanna close by saying something else a bit more personal but I think no less relevant to the reasons why Elena is being recognized tonight and the reasons that her opinions have mattered as much as they have. 
It has something to do with something that you no doubt think about when you think about Justice Kagan. And that something is golf. Did you know she plays? Not regularly, but she has for the last number of summers at least on a small public nine hole course on the Cape. It's fun to see her play and not just because it's fun to see her do something that rare for her, she is actually not very good at. We played last summer with my 17 year old son, Leo. It was great to see her looking for a nod of encouragement from my Leo and he was happy to oblige. You could not help but root for her. But, and this is the takeaway, there was no pretense about her in hacking away at that little ball on the course with me and my son, as there has been no pretense about her in any of her more important and successful endeavors. Elena does not put on airs and she does not have much patience for those who do. But that quality shines through in her work as a justice too. Her style is aimed at drawing people in, not showing it off, at getting you to see a point, not dismissing you for failing to see it. And that instinct reflects, I think, a fundamentally democratic aspiration in her work, a sense of humility underlying the great confidence and ability her inimitable style reflects. And with it comes a recognition, palpable in what she writes and the ideas she stands behind, that she is aware, as any great justice must be, of all those who look to the law and the court she sits on to do right by them, to ensure their constitution is a document that will enable them to engage as thoughtfully and fruitfully in the world as she most certainly has. Thank you, David. And thank you for your indicatable, in uh, your patience uh, in uh, sticking with this despite the technological difficulties. Uh, wonderful. Our next uh, speaker is Yaira Dubin, a uh, former law clerk to Justice Kagan and also a former clerk to Judge Srinivasan, but we understand not the clerk who was just outed by his quotations earlier. Um, Yaira now serves as counsel at O'Melveny and teaches a seminar on the Supreme Court here at NYU. Yaira. Thank you for inviting me here tonight. I'm honored to speak alongside this remarkable group, including another judge I treasure, Chief Judge Srinivasan, to offer a tribute to someone we all hold dear, but whom they all call Elena, and I know as the justice. I recently watched a documentary called The Last Dance. And I thought what one naturally thinks when watching a documentary about Michael Jordan, this reminds me of Justice Kagan. Now, of course, there are some differences. Michael Jordan seems to be a couple inches taller and his court's cool, but it's not quite the highest in the land. Still, the heart of the documentary was a case study in excellence a behind the scenes account of someone performing their craft at the very highest level. That's what I got to see close up when I clerked for Justice Kagan. It's too obvious to say that Justice Kagan has a once in a generation legal mind, but what stays with me always is the extraordinary way in which she put that firepower to work. The key insight of the last dance is how rare it is for someone gifted with off the charts talent to also have an off the charts work ethic. You can hear people describing Jordan in awe one coach said, and I quote, he never freaking turned it off. As someone who had the unbelievable privilege of working closely with Justice Kagan for a whole year, I can tell you with confidence, she never freaking turns it off. The reality is she could get away with far less. If she scribbled a draft of an opinion on a napkin, it would undoubtedly be exceptional, but she would never be satisfied with that. She has to give you her very best, her very best all the time, and it shows. It showed in her work as a professor and as a dean, in her advocacy as Solicitor General and before. It shows in her incisive questioning on the bench. And it shows, perhaps most of all, in her opinions. They are worked and reworked to perfection, from the structure down to the last word. They follow a logic that seems natural, even inevitable, so that by the time she has reached her conclusion, the reader is right there with her, as though it were obvious all along. They are sharp and witty, conversational yet elegant. And they're a joy to read. In a case about disability rights, she introduces us all to a golden doodle named Wonder, who was separated from a child with cerebral palsy on the theory that two-legged assistance should be enough. Other times she calls upon pop culture, recognizing that law and the zeitgeist are and ought to be connected. She recalls Spider-Man to remind us that with great power, there must also come 
great responsibility and an examining faithless electors suggests storylines for future seasons of Veep. She paints vibrant pictures with her words, juxtaposing morning in Nebraska with evening in Greece, New York, so we can better understand how context matters in protecting religious equality. In my view, the justice doesn't do this for the sake of fun references or poetic moments. She does this to bring things together, to make one thing familiar to another, and to connect dots across our cases and our country. This ability to connect, to relate, is not just a feature of her jurisprudence. It's fundamental to who she is. It's what helps Justice Kagan find common ground when at first none appears. When Justice Kagan was but 12 years old, she asked her synagogue for a bat mitzvah. A bar mitzvah is a coming of age ceremony for Jewish boys where they read from the Torah in front of the congregation. Justice Kagan wanted a bat mitzvah to perform the same ritual as a girl, but the presiding rabbi said, no, that wasn't done. She pressed on and before long, this 12 year old girl and the rabbi worked out a compromise, a bat mitzvah where she would read on Friday night instead of Saturday and from the book of Ruth instead of the Torah. Later, Justice Kagan would say it wasn't the perfect solution, but it was something. She was right, it was something. It was Lincoln Square Synagogue's first formal bat mitzvah, and it paved the way for more for future generation of women. Lincoln Square now has an entire bat mitzvah project to help women read from the Torah to celebrate this milestone. That's the thing about Justice Kagan. In a world that sometimes seems hopelessly polarized and antagonistic, she knows the value of common ground. She knows the wisdom of walking toward others so they might walk with her and so that the world can keep walking forward together. For the justice, it's not about the pragmatic value of compromise. It instead reflects her essential approach to the world. She respects people who disagree with her. And she genuinely believes that the adversarial process is a mechanism for parties to resolve difference, not just highlight them. And that judges work together collectively to do exactly that. That doesn't mean the justice never ends up disagreeing with anyone. She has written powerful dissents descends for the ages. She has warned of the dangers of anti-democratic measures that imperil our system of government, of betraying the First Amendment's promise that our government will not divide our pluralistic nation along religious lines, of smashing age-old precedents to smithereens. And she's reminded the court of its enduring duty to declare the law. But she never takes that step to dissent lightly. It is a last resort, never a first. Whether in agreement or dissent, Justice Kagan is always listening to someone else's perspective to refine her own. At the end of our clerkship, she gifted us each a volume of the term's opinions. She wrote in mine, I'll miss your stubbornness. I'll assure you, as I assured my parents, she meant this as a compliment. That's pure Justice Kagan. She wants her clerks to disagree with each other and with her. She wants them to point out every flaw in thinking about the case one way and every law flaw in thinking about the case another and to stand their ground where justified in debating the right answer. As a clerk in the moment, this can be intimidating, but as a clerk in retrospect, this was footage for a highlight reel, the day-to-day -day of a justice confronting some of the most vexing legal challenges of our time. None of this should come as a surprise. It's exactly what she said she would do. It was just over 10 years ago that Justice Kagan stood in the East Room following a bipartisan confirmation and spoke of the oath she would take the next day to defend the constitution and administer justice to the rich and poor alike. And she made a simple promise to the president and everyone in that room and everyone across the nation that she would, and I quote, work her hardest and try her best to fulfill these commitments and serve the country she loves as well as she is able. The last time I saw the justice in person, we were celebrating her decade of service on the bench. We spoke at that celebration of the justice she clerked for the legendary Thurgood Marshall. She honors him every day with her service and in the many times in her career that she has served her country. For her, the most she can do is the least she can do. 10 years of her clerks have taken that dedication to heart. They have poured themselves into public service, all different kinds, with one thing in common, a true commitment, and even more than that, a sense of obligation to this country. The joy in the justice's voice when she hears of her clerks hopes to serve you know you've made her proud. And you may feel in some small way how proud she must have made Justice Marshall telling him similar things. I have always been and always will be 
in awe of Justice Kagan. She has been a hero to me on a very personal level as a woman and a law student and a clerk and a lawyer, and as someone who's had her fair share of hard to win debates with, with rabbinical authorities. <laughs> at the end of my clerkship, we were sitting in the courtyard at lunch with the opinions for the term done when Justice Kagan realized I hadn't seen too many movies growing up. She's a movie buff and so immediately started giving me recommendations. I began jotting them down on a post-it, but she kept going so I pulled another post-it to continue writing and then another and another. As you can see here, I filled post-it after post-it, writing as fast as I could to keep up and I kept every single one. The broader point is this, if we're here to honor everything Justice Kagan has done and all that she will do, the 78th volume of the annual survey is a lovely start, and I am deeply honored to be a part of it. But I think we'll need about a million more post-its. Thank you all. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rick Pildes of our faculty here at NYU. He's the Sudler Family Professor of Constitutional Law, um, and like Justice Kagan, former clerk to Justice Marshall. Rick. Thanks, uh, Trevor, and I'm honored to be invited to contribute to this well-deserved tribute to my friend, Justice Elena, Elena Kagan. Um, so what can I say about a cigar-smoking, Scalia-loving, big-game hunter who's also a huge fan of opera, but at the same time, comic book, action, hero movies? Justice Kagan is a stereotype-defying wholly unique person with the strength of character to present herself to the world in the way she chooses, regardless of what people think someone like her ought to be. Those qualities of Elena's were on display for the world in the most memorable moment of her confirmation hearing in which she undoubtedly freaked out the White House by going completely off script in response to Senator Lindsey Graham who asked her, where were you at Christmas? The question was meant to be a prelude to asking her about a terrorism attack that had occurred on Christmas. But as many of you know, Elena responded, like all Jews, I was probably at a Chinese restaurant. In that moment before the Senate, her characteristically quick wit and infectious laughter won over the senators. But I wanna comment on a deeper aspect of that moment. Many American Jews are uncomfortable for various reasons talking about their Jewishness in public settings, let alone in front of millions of people in one of the most important moments of their lives. But Elena wears who she is easily, comfortably. And in that moment, she made Jews across America feel recognized, dignified, proud. And this was all the more fitting because Elena occupies the seat on the court that was held by the first and greatest Jewish justice on the Supreme Court, Louis Brandeis, whose nomination, by the way, was vehemently opposed by the anti-Semitic president of Harvard University, the place where Elena went on to become dean of the great Harvard Law School. I first met Elena about 35 years ago, shortly after we had both finished clerking a few years apart for the same judge, who told me I should get to know her because he thought we would probably hit it off. I remember her as painfully shy back then, believe it or not. So I could never have predicted her, her sitting before the Senate responding in that way to a question. And for the students who are listening, I think it's good to know that because you shouldn't be intimidated by the public figure you know today. Now in that moment uh, before, uh, I'm sorry, as a justice, uh, I see embodied in her work the same sensibility reflected in the unique mix of seemingly contradictory personal characteristics I mentioned at the outset. I think Elena's approach to law is to see it as a means to pursue justice and fairness while also trying to accommodate as much as possible conflicting or competing or contradictory values, even as cases must be decided and hard decisions must be made to use the subtle tools the law provides to sacrifice as little as possible the important values that exist even in the losing side of the case. I think Justice Kagan is one of the two or three justices on the court who most brings that vision of the law to her work. She respects and tries to navigate the competing important values at stake in most cases before the court. This doesn't mean she lacks conviction, far from it. 
I'm sure you're familiar with at least some of her passionate dissenting opinions. But it means even with those convictions, she looks to accommodate or sacrifice as little as necessary the competing values at issue. I think that's also the sensibility of democracy itself, as others have mentioned in their own way. And Elena embodies that sensibility as much as any public figure I know. And her, and her concern for democracy is also one of the core areas of her contributions on the court. She's quickly made herself into the most knowledgeable and engaged justice on the court on issues involving the structure of American democracy. And that's something that other justices on the court clearly recognize themselves. When Justice Ginsburg was alive, she assigned Justice Kagan the court's most important opinions on issues concerning the structure of democracy, even though the youngest justices usually get the most tedious cases. That's how Elena came to write one of her most important opinions thus far, which others have also mentioned, her dissent in a case I was involved in from the court's refusal to strike down partisan gerrymandering. She's also been given important majority opinions in cases involving the Voting Rights Act and the intersection of race, politics, and redistricting. She's written powerful dissents in cases involving campaign finance. I think Elena sees protecting the structures of American democracy as one area where the court must play a major role. I think she sees herself, as I do, as an heir to John Hart Ely, the great constitutional theorist who wrote Democracy and Distrust, and who insisted that the court's most important role was protecting the structures of the democratic process. And in the years to come, I think this is one area in which I expect her to make an enormous contribution. I think Justice Kagan is a treasure for the court in the country and a treasure for me to have known personally all these years. I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak today and for recognizing the great contribution she's made to American democracy and to the law in the short time she's been on the court thus far. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rick. Our final dedicating speaker this evening is Martha Minow, the 300th anniversary university professor at Harvard Law School, uh, Justice Kagan's successor as Dean of the Law School and Dean Manning's predecessor in that role. Martha. Thank you, Trevor. It's a true honor to be here. For years, members of the Harvard Law faculty disagreed about many issues. But when the then president, Larry Summers, proposed to move the law school's campus from its historic location to a place in Alston, Massachusetts, away from the rest of the school in Cambridge and across the Charles River, the faculty suddenly was unanimous and voted in opposition. Pressed by the president to do something about it, the law school dean asked a recently arrived member of the faculty, Elena Kagan, to look into the issue. It was a thankless task converted into a tour de force by this young woman recently arrived from service in the President Clinton White House. She reframed the question to ask, under what circumstances would and should the law school move? She interviewed and listened to everyone imaginably connected to the issues. She generated multiple compelling and detailed options. The entire faculty joined in awe. Not too long thereafter, the president of Harvard appointed a new dean named Elena Kagan. It helped that she was what some folks in the Clinton White House described this, the smartest person in the room. I remember her as a student, relatively quiet, incredibly hardworking, savvy, brilliant. She became a litigator and then a distinctive and incisive scholar of the First Amendment, a star Socratic teacher known for questions as precise as a scalpel and wit quick and good spirited. All of this was on full display in the Alston project and more. Her fearless immersion in every aspect from the depth of the water table relevant to potential construction 
to land use rules and conditions on available properties. From potential synergies intellectually between law and arts and sciences versus law and business and policy schools, her ability to transform polarized conflict into concrete and constructive options. Her work to listen and build on all she heard. Her talent in shifting the ground through analysis and evidence. Her imaginative and fearless reconception of the beloved athletic fields of Harvard and the Harvard Business School parking lot as options for the future home of Harvard Law School. Memorably put equity and shared sacrifice as well as feasibility on the table. I remember later colleagues in our engineering school telling me mournfully, now the president wants us to move across the river and we don't have an Elena Kagan. While, while a professor at Harvard, her research on administrative law and executive power integrated political science, legal doctrine, and on the ground know-how. The award-winning scholarship is magisterial as it is influential. As Dean Kagan, she brought the qualities of rigor, fearlessness, and imagination to become one of the great deans of the school's over 200 year history. She demanded excellence, evidence, and the very best from everyone. As her successor, I heard more than once that working for Dean Kagan upped the game for the faculty and the staff. She held no one to high standards more than herself. From top to bottom, from food services to faculty hiring, admissions processes to architectural design, multi-year financial planning to artwork in the pedestrian tunnels underneath the buildings. Her deanship was transformative on all dimensions. The lodestar for Dean Kagan was putting students for the first time as the most cherished center of the school. Here are her own reflections on her time as Dean. She said, I've led a school whose faculty and students examine and discuss and debate every aspect of our law and legal system. And what I've learned most is that no one has a monopoly on truth or wisdom. I've learned that we make progress by listening to each other across every apparent political or ideological divide. She brought all of her talents and commitments to the role of Solicitor General, and now for the past 10 years to the Supreme Court. It is rare to see such qualities of excellence across so many domains, sheer analytic power, vision, practicality, capacity to put herself in other shoes, listening and imagining, questions that get to the heart of the matter, and also a curiosity that has led her to move constantly from being a newcomer to an expert in every new field. Her utter integrity, her cogent, accessible, and memorable writing that reveals her effectiveness as a teacher in making things stick. And yes, the pop culture maven, uh, as already described. She quoted the Marvel Comics case. She said, what we decide, we can undecide, but stare decisis teaches us that we should exercise that authority sparingly. And cited, of course, to Amazing Fantasy number five, the Spider-Man comic, and I quote, in this world with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Others here and elsewhere provide assessments of her influence thus far on the court. I commend to you her concurring opinion in last terms, Little Sisters of the Poor Saints Peter and Paul Home versus Pennsylvania. Amid broad assertions by three other opinions, frankly, some less careful in their reasoning than hers, many ships were passing in the night. But in contrast, her opinion is precise, cogent, and prescient about the next stages of litigation and relevant administrative action. Indeed, her opinion attends to and listens to a majority concern about congressional authority, another concurrence interest in ending the dispute once and for all, and a dissent's deep awareness of those whose interests were foreclosed by both the agency and the majority. 
how fitting and lovely it is to see this annual survey of American law dedicated to Justice Elena Kagan. Maybe there is a time now for one more quotation from a Marvel comic. We are capable of so much more than we think we are. All we have to do is reach for it. All we have to do is be fearless. How spectacular to see my former student, my former boss, my dear friend, Justice Elena Kagan honored here. And may this provide more wins for your sales in the splendid years of service to come. Bravo. Thank you, Martha. Ilan? Justice Kagan, on behalf of the New York University Annual Survey of American Law, I would like to dedicate our 78th volume to you in honor of your contributions to American law. Thank you. Justice Kagan, the floor is yours if you would like it. Uh, well, thank you, Dean Morrison, and thank you, Ilan. Uh, this is a great, great honor. Uh, Il Ilan, first to you, I mean, your remarks at the beginning of this program were so heartfelt and, uh, and very meaningful to me because of that. And, um, uh, you know, if, if, um, uh, if the, the future legal profession is in hands like yours, and I'm sure your, um, your colleagues on the, on the um, Survey of American Law will all be in um, good shape in the years to come. Uh, Trevor, uh, this, is, this is an awfully hard job to be a dean in these days. I mean, being a dean is hard anytime, as, as I know well. Um, but, um, but in these days, uh, you have your work cut out for you. And uh, I just, you know, a tip of my hat to you for everything that you're doing at NYU. Uh, Trevor and I go back a ways. Uh, I know each other before he became dean. And uh, when he became dean, um, uh, you just knew that NYU had made the right choice. And I think he's, he's shown it every step of the way since then. So um, thank you for uh, your wonderful stewardship of a, of a truly magnificent law school. And, uh, and thank you for this wonderful honor as well. Um, I mean, this has been quite the experience uh, sitting here for, for an, an hour or so. And most people, uh, you know, bunch of people don't get together and talk like this about them until they're dead. Uh, so, you know, it's, 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 it's nicer to hear it. It's nicer to have your funeral when you're alive, so to speak. And um, uh, it, it has, it, it, uh, it's, it's been kind of uh, humbling, but, but uh, I have to admit a bit exhilarating. Judge Katzman emailed me a few days ago and he was one of the recipients of this award. And he said, Oh, you'll love it. It's such a great event. And, um, and now I can see why. It's because like, when do you get to just sit here and, and listen to people say ridiculously flattering, much too flattering things about you for an hour? It's, it's, uh, it's kind of fun. And um, if you want to do it next week, I'm available too. Um, uh, I, 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 just a, a, a couple of quick things. And then I want to thank some of the other people who have been on this call. Uh, first off, I want to explain all these Spider-Man references. You know, for those who uh, don't know the opinion, I have this feeling like, like this woman is just quoting Spider-Man everywhere. And, um, and the reason I was quoting Spider-Man, it was, it was really one of my favorite opinions to write. I think it's a pretty good opinion to read, but it was, uh, it was a case, it, was a, it actually started as a patent case. And it was a case where the patent was on um, this, uh, this little Spider-Man thing that you put on your hand and you were able to spin webs with it. So the case was all about a patent for this Spider-Man contraption. And uh, so who could resist the opportunity but to quote Stan Lee? Um, uh, more seriously, I think, uh, you know, I think the question that comes out of listening to people for an hour is how is it that I'm such a great consensus builder and seek common ground so much but that when, every, when people want to uh, read from my opinions, they're always reading from dissents. Um, so uh, I, I think that, you know, that's a pretty deep question for a judge is where you seek consensus and where you get off and uh, speak, speak your mind and speak it in uh, a powerful way that takes the majority 
the task. And uh, every year on this court, I ask myself how to um, think about those two roles of a judge and, uh, and whether over time uh, they, ch they change or um, you know, how they relate to each other. And I continue to be thinking about that question. And um, these, these, uh, the, the, these comments have, have given me even more reason to do so. Um, I do want, uh, I, I feel as though the people on this call um, didn't get the introductions that they deserved. And I, I wanna say a few words about uh, each of them. And um, I think in some ways they said a lot about themselves and picking out what they wanted to talk about uh, uh, when they talked about me. But I just want to, um, to, 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 to say a few words about how I know them and, uh, and, and why it is that I love and respect them so much. So I'll, I'll, I'll do them in order. Uh, uh, Judge Srinivasan, I met um, for the first time when uh, I became, so, when I was nominated to become Solicitor General, a, a job that I was completely unequipped for in some ways, because I had at that time not only never done a Supreme Court argument, but never done an appellate argument at all. And Judge Srinivasan, before he became a brilliant judge, was a brilliant Supreme Court advocate and had served in the Solicitor General's office for quite some time. And, um, and became for me the person, my go-to person in thinking first about how I was uh, going to go through my confirmation process and next, how I was going to actually do the job. Um, uh, uh, he, as I said, you know, it, it, it seems amazing that anybody could do something better than Sri Srinivasan did oral advocacy at the Supreme Court, but he's proved himself to be a magnificent judge and uh, when he talks about my writing, I mean, what you have to know is that, uh, is what a wonderful writer he is. And, and so it's an incredible compliment to me that uh, somebody who is so gifted with language um, uh, picked that out to, 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 to talk about uh, tonight. Um, uh, he is also uh, newly appointed the chief judge of the DC circuit and impossible as that might seem to believe, uh, might just be making people forget about um, their before now best, greatest chief judge ever, uh, Merrick Garland. Uh, John Manning, John Manning was my first hire at Harvard Law School and um, a really quite extraordinary one. Uh, I, I, uh, judge Srinivasan, um, said something about a five tool player. I used to think of people as triple threats. Um, the triple threat being, are you a great scholar? Are you a great teacher? And are you a great institution builder? And John Manning was all three. And I knew when I hired him that he might um, well become a Dean someday. Um, uh, he's making it look easy in that role, much like you, Trevor. It's sort of like watching Joe DiMaggio playing center field. Um, uh, making all these incredibly difficult catches look effortless. Um, and, uh, and so it's one of my great prides that I brought him onto the Harvard Law School. Now, it doesn't strike me as uh, an accident that John decided that he wanted to focus on my more textualist opinions. Uh, you heard a lot about Milner and Yates uh, and all the times when I say the court doesn't get to rewrite opinions. Um, uh, because uh, I learned those words from John Manning and his textualist friends. John Manning is one of the great scholars of textualism and other methods of statutory interpretation. And uh, as, a, as, as his colleague and now as a judge, uh, I, I learned a great deal from him. And, and it's, um, uh, I, I, I go back to Harvard every year to teach uh, in September and I always do a few hours with John about some of the recent statutory interpretation cases that the court has, um, has decided. And it's uh, three hours where I think I, I learn as much about what the court has done in the prior term as, uh, as I ever do. And so I am in, uh, just uh, very grateful for his continuing attention to my work. Um, uh, Judge Barron, 
um, who I, I, I hope has gotten his audio back. Um, when he said he has the ringside seat for my career, I mean, that is uh, true as true can be. What we met when he was in his 20s and I was in my 30s and uh, I was a White House lawyer and he was the lawyer at the Office of Legal Counsel. And, um, uh, you know, as a White House person, I sort of wanted to get my way. And one of the jobs of OLC lawyers is to try to prevent that from happening when the law suggests that it ought not to happen. And um, uh, I, I did feel myself like sort of, uh, uh, you know, I was a good lawyer myself and um, uh, I, 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 I tended to win a lot of arguments with people from OLC. And I think um, they, uh, the, the heads of OLC knew that. So they just put David Barron on everything that I touched. And David Barron's task was to just out argue me. And he did constantly over and over again, where uh, uh, no matter what I thought, how well, how good I thought my brief was, David would find a place where it was wrong. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, I was sometimes quite annoyed at him at that time, but uh, respected him enormously. And that respect has only grown as, as David said, we. We started at Harvard Law School, both trying to get tenure uh, on the same day. And uh, in, in adjoining offices, we, we, uh, we wrote this article together uh, that he talked about. Uh, he has become an extraordinary friend. Um, and uh, when, when he talked about me, he said that, that I was um, a good listener. But in fact, uh, David is the best listener there is. So if, if, if I could combine Shree's writing with David's listening, David's ability to, to really sort of open his mind to take in new ideas um, and, to, and to consider them thoughtfully and without prejudging them and to adjust his own thinking and never to be dogmatic and always to uh, seek to learn as you listen to other people, I mean, for me, that is the essence of David Barron. So uh, if, I've, if, I've, if I've learned a little bit of that uh, listening and learning skill from him, uh, I, I will be very grateful indeed. Uh, Yaira Dubin, um, you know, it's one of the great joys of this job to work with a new set of young and brilliant and eager um, clerks every year. And uh, every year, I feel incredibly grateful to have that be part of the job for me. Um, uh, I'm not always the easiest boss in the world. I make people work hard. I don't pat them on the back every step of the way. Uh, I, um, uh, I notice their mistakes as well as noticing their, um, uh, their triumphs. And uh, uh, and I'm, um, and I'm hard to argue with, you know, I, I, I um, uh, and just, you know, here these, 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 uh, these clerks, they're all 30 years old and they, here they are and they're, uh, they come to, and they're working for a Supreme Court justice and they're a little bit in awe. And, um, and, and then, uh, uh, you know, it's just hard to talk back and to say you're wrong and to say, here's why, and to say, I'm not giving up until uh, you realize that you're wrong. And, um, and if I said in uh, Yaira's, uh, in the book I gave Yaira, that I loved her stubbornness, uh, that was true. I loved her, uh, her stubbornness and her grit and her ability to keep coming back at me uh, as, as, as much as I loved her brilliance. And although she's the person who's least well known on this Zoom call now, um, uh, she won't be in, you know, if you wake up in another decade or two. Um, the things that she said about me, uh, uh, she said she started like uh, with that Michael Jordan thing about work ethic and perfectionism. Well, that's the year at to a T. And if she noticed that in me, I certainly noticed that in her. And um, it's why I, I value her and treasure her and did as, as uh, when she was a clerk to me and um, 
and 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 uh, as now as as a, as a good friend. Um, you know, Rick Pildes, uh, if I can say um, to you, Trevor, I mean, Rick Pildes is one of the great lights of your faculty, uh, which is one of the great faculties in the country. Um, uh, so uh, great uh, that uh, I tried for, I think I was Dean for six years, and I think I tried for all six of those years to get Rick Pildes to come to Harvard. I have to say that I was pretty successful in faculty hiring, but Rick uh, was committed to NYU and uh, loved the school and loved his role at the school and uh, made it impossible for me to hire him away. But if there's, um, if there's anybody who's, uh, if there's anybody in the legal academy who I feel best about when they say, oh, that was a good opinion, I think Rick Pildes is that person because Rick is so damned hard to please, you know, and uh, he has such high standards and and he sort of knows everything about a variety of things, but especially about areas, as he said, that I write in a good deal. And um, for me, when Rick Pildes looks at one of my uh election opinions, campaign finance, um, voting rights. Um, and and, and uh, I, I always want his feedback. I want his criticism. I want him to tell me where I've gone wrong. But when he tells me, oh, you got that right. And, um, and that was a good job that you did. Uh, it just makes my day. Um, so, um, so, uh, you know, I will try to live up to his own uh, uh, concern for democracy and his own, um, uh, you know, a attempt to protect the structure of our democratic system. Um, and finally, uh, Martha Minow uh, was first a teacher of mine. People don't realize um, how much law schools have changed. She was uh, one of only two women professors that I had when I went to law school. Even she wasn't actually really a professor. She, I mean, she was a professor, but um, she didn't teach me in a regular course. Uh, a few friends and I needed an extra credit in our third year and went to Martha Minow and asked her if she would just do a reading group with us. And I have no idea why she said yes, except that it's just in Martha's personality to say yes to interested people of all kinds, whether it's students or faculty members or uh, people in a wide variety of other parts of the legal profession. If you come to her with an idea, she always wants to be there to help carry it out. And so uh, that was where I first got to know Martha and she soon became one of um, uh, my best backers and my best friends. And uh, when I was Dean, she was uh, really the person who was, uh, who did all the work. Uh, you know, I, I hope you have one of these, Trevor. Uh, you take all the credit and somebody else does all the work. And uh, for Martha, that, that was, uh, uh, that's the role she played for me. And so I was pretty, pretty darn glad when she became my successor and could start taking the credit for herself in what was uh, an extraordinary deanship of her own. Um, the thing about Martha is that she was always, um, even when she was a dean, was so much more than a dean that she has sort of these uh, super wide ranging interests and a finger in every pot. And, you know, even while she was dean, she was co-head of the Legal Services Corporation and a major figure in lots of uh, the, in the nonprofit arena and doing writing and teaching a full load. And somehow you can't imagine uh, everything, that, uh, everything that she's doing or her um, incredible breadth of interests and knowledge. And so when she talked uh, for me about um, the breadth of knowledge that I needed to do that Austin report and, and the way I reconceptualized the problem and the imagination I brought to it, well, I hate to say this, but she was speaking about herself and, and, and not about, about me. So I think uh, um, you know, everybody on this Zoom event has, 
has has heard um, all these people, you know, saying awfully nice things about me, uh, most of which I don't deserve. But um, in in the same breath, they were really telling you about themselves and what extraordinary people they are, and what uh, extraordinary contributions they've made um, to the legal community. So I am just grateful beyond measure that I have them as um, my friends and a little bit my fan club. Bravo, Justice Kagan. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Trevor. And thank you for this great honor again. We are tremendously grateful that you've allowed us the honor of making you our dedicatee this year. I wanna thank you again for that. I wanna thank all of our terrific speakers this evening. Your remarks were really wonderful. Thanks to each one of you. I know each of you is very busy and we're grateful that you could make this time for us. And last but not least, I do wanna thank Elan and his colleagues at the annual survey for the spectacular choice in making Justice Kagan this year's dedicatee and for all of the hard work that went into this evening's event. Thank you again to everyone and good night. <laughs>